regions. China had made great mathematical leaps, but the next great mathematical breakthroughs were to happen in a country lying to the southwest of China, a country that had a rich mathematical tradition that would change the face of maths forever. India's first great mathematical gift lay in the world of number. Like the Chinese, the Indians had discovered the mathematical benefits of the decimal place value system and were using it by the middle of the 3rd century AD. It's been suggested that the Indians learned the system from Chinese merchants travelling through India with their counting gods. Well, they may well just have stumbled across it themselves. It's all such a long time ago that it's shrouded in mystery. We may never know how the Indians came up with their number system, but we do know that they refined and perfected it, creating the ancestors for the nine numerals we use across the world today. Many rank the Indian system of counting as one of the greatest intellectual innovations of all time, developing into the closest thing we could call a universal language. But there was one number missing, and it was the Indians who would introduce it to the world. The earliest known recording of this new number dates from the 9th century, that was probably in practical use for centuries before. This strange new numeral is engraved on the wall of a small temple in the fort of Gwalior in central India. So here we are, in one of the true holy sites of the mathematical world. And what I'm looking for is in this inscription written on the wall. Up here are some numbers, and here's the new number. It's zero. Egyptians, Mesopotamians, and as we've seen, the Chinese, zero had been in use, but as a placeholder, an empty space to show a zero inside a number. The Indians transformed zero from a mere placeholder into a number that made sense in its own right, a number for calculation, for investigation. This brilliant conceptual leap would revolutionise mathematics. <laughs> Now, with just ten digits, zero to nine, it was suddenly possible to capture astronomically large numbers in an incredibly efficient way. But why did the Indians make this imaginative leap? Well, we'll never know for sure, but it's possible that the idea and symbol that the Indians used for zero came from calculations they did with stones in the sand. When stones were removed from the calculation, a small round hole was left in its place, representing the movement from something to nothing. But perhaps there's also a cultural reason for the invention of zero. For the ancient Indians, the concepts of nothingness and eternity lay at the very heart of their belief system. In the religions of India, the universe was born out of nothingness, and nothingness is the ultimate goal of humanity. 
So it's perhaps not surprising that a culture that so enthusiastically embraced the void should be happy with a notion of zero. The Indians even used the word for the philosophical idea of the void, shunya, to represent the new mathematical term zero. In the 7th century, the brilliant Indian mathematician Brahmagupta proved some of the essential properties of zero. Brahmagupta's rules about calculating with zero are taught in schools all over the world to this day. 1 plus zero equals 1. 1 minus zero equals 1. 1 times zero is equal to zero. But Brahmagupta came a cropper when he tried to do 1 divided by zero. After all, what number times zero equals one? It would require a new mathematical concept, that of infinity, to make sense of dividing by zero. And the breakthrough was made by a 12th century Indian mathematician called Bhaskara II. And it works like this. If I take a fruit and I divide it into halves, I get two pieces. So, one divided by a half is two. If I divide it into thirds, I get three pieces. So when I divide it into smaller and smaller fractions, I get more and more pieces. So ultimately, when I divide by a piece which is of zero size, I'll have infinitely many pieces. So for Bhaskara, one divided by zero is infinity. <laughs> But the Indians would go further in their calculations with zero. For example, if you take three from three and get zero, what happens when you take four from three? It looks like you have nothing. But the Indians recognize that this was a new sort of nothing, negative numbers. The Indians called them debts because they were perfect for solving equations like, if I have three batches of material and take four away, how many have I left? This may seem odd and impractical, but that was the beauty of Indian mathematics. Their ability to come up with negative numbers and zero was because they thought of numbers as abstract entities. They weren't just for counting and measuring pieces of cloth. They had a life of their own, floating free of the real world. This led to an explosion of mathematical ideas. <laughs> The Indian's abstract approach to mathematics soon revealed a new side to the problem of how to solve quadratic equations, that is, equations including numbers to the power of two. Brahmagupta's understanding of negative numbers allowed him to see that quadratic equations always have two solutions, one of which could be negative. Brahmagupta went even further, solving quadratic equations with two unknowns. A question which wouldn't be considered in the West until 1657, when the French mathematician Fermat challenged his colleagues with the same problem. Little did he know that they'd been beaten to a solution by Brahmagupta a thousand years earlier. Brahmagupta was beginning to find abstract ways of solving equations. But astonishingly, he was also developing a new mathematical language to express that abstraction. Brahmagupta was experimenting with ways of writing his equations down, using the initials of the names of different colours to represent unknowns in his equations. A new mathematical language was coming to life, which would ultimately lead to the X's and Y's which fill today's mathematical journal. But it wasn't just new notation that was being developed. 
Indian mathematicians were responsible for making fundamental new discoveries in the theory of trigonometry.